again, welcome everyone. We have a lot of people in here. And right now I'm gonna pull up the agenda. So this is how things are gonna go. And I'm gonna switch um, the order of our, present, our presenters today. So the Coach de Pueblo is gonna go first. Um, and then the Cherokee Nation will talk, if everyone's cool with that. All right. And just before we get started, um, I just want to put some norms in here. These are just quick normal norms that everyone has at this point, because everyone, I'm sure everyone's been in a million meetings virtually at this point. Um, so if you look on here, you'll see that just, we're going to hold all the Q&A until the Q&A portion um, of the presentations. And then we're going to do, when everyone's speaking or talking, just please mute your lines. I'm going to try to moderate them so that they, you know, stay muted too, so that, you know, don't hear any background noise, but just so everyone knows. And again, hello, Wingapu Nitapuak. My name is Young Brinson, and I'm from the Nansen and Ottawa tribes of Virginia. And I'm also a program specialist here at the Administration for Native Americans. My portfolio focuses really in Alaska, but I do have some Eastern grantees, and I've been working here for a year and a half now. Um, and it's my pleasure to facilitate Use It or Lose It. So why are we here? Well, the whole um, idea or concept around use or lose it is that people learn a language, but then don't use it. And so they lose it. And so today's presenters will focus on how to incentivize usage in jobs, how to get the language out into the community, any innovations in teacher training um, and language retention strategies. And I do wanna put a quote in here by Chief Atkins from the Chickahominy tribe of Virginia. Being that I am from um, Virginia as well, I just wanted to put in this awesome quote from Chief Atkins which says that people need to understand who we are today and the struggles we've had to go through just to remain who we are, just to live our, um, live our culture. We're part of a mainstream America, but we still have to live in two lives. And I think that really harkens in on what this theme is about is that no matter how much we learn our language and we try and try and try, we're still gonna be bombarded with mainstream American culture and English. And so we have to always strive as hard as we can to make sure we retain and engage with our language by, you know, whether you have signs that you put up in your community that's in, our, in your language, or whether you find an app that you can practice um, language with other speakers, like I think that's super important. So I really just thought this was an awesome quote and really honed in on everything that we're going to see in this presentation today. And so first, we're going to have Tracy Cordero. Um, and she is super awesome. She works with the Carries Children's Link Learning Center. And I'm going to share, let her share her screen in just a second. So let me switch screens real quick. And Tracy, if you want to go ahead and share yours. Thank you. And is my screen showing okay? Thumbs up. You can see it. Yep, I can see it, Tracy. Thank you so much. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Go to say hofa. My name is Tracy Cordero. I'm from Coach T Pueblo here in New Mexico. Um, I am from Coach T. I work in Coach T. Caris Children's Learning Center is located here in our Pueblo. And for KCLC, I'm the director of the Indigenous Montessori Institute. So our school's mission is that KCLC strives to reclaim our children's education and honor our heritage by using a comprehensive cultural and academic curriculum to assist families in nurturing, care-speaking, holistically healthy, community-minded, and academically strong students. I just want to point out two key words about our mission here under um, our children's education and honor our heritage, the word and here is crucial because our school is really trying to create an environment, a learning environment where our students don't have to choose between being good coach T children and good students. It's an education that does both and nurtures both so that they're good coach T students without compromising one or the other. The other key word in our mission is to assist families um, and that's because um, we like to operate from a strength-based approach. And so we come from the foundation that our people know 
Our people have the expertise, have the desire to learn. And so we're not giving or doing anything for our families that they don't already have or they can't already do. And so all we're doing is, is assisting them in, in giving their children the education that they want for them themselves. Um, so our first element, one of the first elements in our mission is care speaking. Here's a quick little clip, hopefully it works. So in this clip, I don't know how well the audio was on your end, but in this clip, we've got a 10 year old student um, who's reading what she wrote. Our language is an oral language only. So she wrote it down in English and she's outputting in Keras to her classmates, telling them what she did on the weekend. And she says she went to the market to buy some watermelon, but they didn't have enough money. And so she says that, but one of her classroom peers notices or, or um, recognizes that she could say it more detailedly, like um, instead of just saying we didn't have money, he tells her or guides her to say, we didn't have enough money. We didn't take enough money. And so she takes the feedback and she just moves right along in her presentation. And so this is the elementary class, which is a dual language class, half the time in English, half the time in Keras. Um, and so even though it's not written, even though she's reading and writing in English, she's outputting in Keras to the rest of her peers. Um, holistically healthy. So we want our children to understand this concept of health in all their ways of life, physically, emotionally, nutrition, nutritionally, um, mentally, just all the aspects that make someone healthy. We want them to know it and we want them to know what health means in our own way of life. So yes, you know, healthy food, carbs and calories, but also what is the spiritual time behind this food? How does, what does it mean to us this time of the year and who and how do we use it? Um, we want our children to be community minded. And this is the idea that no matter what I do in my life, I have a responsibility to contribute to my community. And so we come from the place that everyone is always welcome. We try to be inclusive as much as we can. Um, and we try to um, lean into the community and pull from the community and then serve the community in all the ways that we can. And so these different pictures represent that. Um, lastly, um, we also want our kids to be academically strong. And so I might cut this short just for time's sake, but I'll, sh I'll share this.
again. I don't know how the audio was, but what's happening in this clip, this is the Montessori classroom. It's the same student we saw in the first clip. In this clip, she's six. In the first clip, she was 10. Um, she's 10. And so in this clip, she's doing a multiplication problem um, that is in the million. And the behind the camera, a group of students with one of the um, elder teachers is playing a guessing game of animals. So at the very beginning, you hear her counting in carrots, and then she's paying attention to the action and she guesses, her guess is walrus. So she says walrus, and it's not the right answer. So she goes back to counting, counting, you know, she's, you hear her again, counting in carrots. She's doing a multiplication that is in the million. Um, and so she thinks she's got it right. She calls over the English speaking elementary teacher and says, you know, here's what happened. There was a zero there. And so now the answer is 17,500,000. She sits and she's doing a multiplication problem that is written on paper in English. She's counting and thinking in Paris in the million and then outputting to the English teacher in English. Um, and so just another example of um, how our mission plays out when language is the foundation. And it's these elements, holistically healthy, the community-minded, the care-speaking, and the academically strong that um, were the foundation became the need to develop a teacher training center. And so KCLC serves children two and a half up through 12 years old, but we needed teachers to be able to come to our school and teach with us. Um, and so we created the Indigenous Montessori Institute. Um, you'll see here that um, came out of our own need to develop a teacher pipeline. There weren't any training centers that credentialed people in Montessori and that made them fluent in Keras, our heritage language. And lastly, we are redefining what it means to be successful and to achieve an indigenous education. And so there weren't, there isn't a teacher training center that did all of these things for us. And so we had to do it ourselves. Um, you know, again, the need for IMI, IMI, indigenous people were the first architects, the first biologists, botanists, the first astronomers, the first authors. But that isn't told to us. That isn't in any of our teacher training centers. And so we have to do that. And when we do this, our hope is that we reclaim the education of our children through teacher training, that we promote um, exercise to the exercising educational sovereignty in our indigenous nation, and that we restore our own indigenous knowledge systems as the foundation for building all forms of indigenous education. And we do this by disrupting and dismantling systems of white supremacy culture in our education system. Um, and so, so IMI, the Indigenous Montessori Institute, is an anti-racist, anti-biased approach to educational reform using indigenous knowledge systems and the Montessori philosophy or approach to deliver teacher training. Um, we aim to decolonize education in the classrooms and at the systems level, and then again, restore our own indigenous knowledge system so that we can do school, so we can educate in a way that centers our own languages, our own values, and our own beliefs about our children and education. Through IMI, the Indigenous Montessori Institute, we offer two tracks of training. The first is called PI, Philosophy of Indigenous Education, so PI. Um, and in, the, in PI, we offer 10 separate training modules. And these PI training modules, they're what make KCLC, our school program, everything it is outside of the Montessori approach. And so outside of the Montessori approach, KCLC is an anti-racist, anti-biased approach to education. It's centered on indigenous education models. What do we have in our communities that we have known for generations that we can pull from to use as academic content? 
We rely on all generations to get the teaching done. So we're intergenerational. Um, we rely on our language. In fact, the language, our language is the foundation, is the center of our programming. So it's not just the 45 minute block. It's what the entire program is built around. And through that, lang through that language, we implement we use our own indigenous knowledge systems for all area of curricula. So science, right? Understanding, math, understanding, health. We have all of these things in our community. Um, and then again, redefining what it means to be successful and to achieve. So we want our students to be good students. We want them to be able to thrive academically and go to college and be doctors and lawyers and whatever else but we also want them to know what role they have in our community. And we want them to just, just as much as we want them to survive and thrive in the outside world, we want them to have the skills and the knowledge to survive and carry on our way of life too. And so I always use the example of my nephew who's a student there now at KCLC. We want him to be a good student and get a good grades and all that. But I also want him to be here and be able to be the governor of our tribe if he has to one day. And because our school nurtured that in him. And so he's never having to choose between, you know, being a good student or learning the language, he's getting them both. And then lastly, we do training in how can we build our school systems? How can we build our policies and procedures? How can we build our curricula to sustain our way of life? instead of to contradict it or do away with it. Um, and so these 10 training modules um, are the scope and sequence of training for the philosophy of indigenous education. Alongside of the philosophy of indigenous education, we offer training in the Montessori approach. And so through the Montessori um, teacher training course, um, these are the, the focus areas of that training. So Montessori training provides us the structure to deliver all of the academic content. And I wanna be very clear that Montessori is an international um, model of education. So all around the world, people are doing Montessori. Um, and Montessori comes with a lot of good and it's the right and best thing for a lot of people. For us, Montessori is the tool that we use for language revitalization. And so our box is Keras. That's the box. And we pour a little bit of Montessori in that because it allows um, the language, our language to exist naturally. It's a hands-on approach to teaching children all of this academic content. Um, our pie track philosophy of indigenous education those training modules, I said, they're based off all the elements of KCLC that are not Montessori, but they're very much also based off of this chart and the next slide I'll show you. This chart came from um, Dr. Joseph Henry Sina, who is a tribal councilman here in Coach T. He's our grandparent. Um, he's somebody that we heavily rely on, both through the school as a founding um, board member, but also as a community member, as a tribal leader. And so this chart and the next slide, it shows us the differences between Han teaching and learning. So our people, indigenous teaching and learning and Medicana schooling. Um, Medicana is like the white way or outside way. And we just see here the comparison on, in our way, the grandparents, you know, are crucial to learning and to teaching. They play a role in all of it. Um, whereas in the Medicana schooling, you know, it's child and parent you know, who's the legal guardian here? Um, next, we have um, this idea of education for interdependence. And so earlier I talked about our school's mission, having an element of community mindedness. This is where that comes from. The idea that when I succeed in school, how can I use this to further my community? What is my role? What is my responsibility with this new knowledge to serve my community with. 
were taught by um, community members. So it literally takes a village. It's not just something nice to say and that looks good on the wall. We all play a role and have a responsibility to our children. And then the idea that um, education happens in the context of real life, right? And this is the language. This is what where your language comes from. Um, and so no matter what I'm doing, it's always an opportunity to learn. It's not inside four walls between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. It happens everywhere with everyone. Um, and then number seven, crucial, right, our, our spirituality. So learning and spirituality are not separate. You know, you can't have, for us, you can't have one without the other. In fact, when our school day starts for our children and they go outside to pray, the first thing they ask for is to be enlightened, to learn. Um, and so, so our philosophy of indigenous education, our training modules are based off of this comparison, are based off of this information provided to us by Dr. Sina. Um, this is what our training scope and sequence looks like. And so these are the different um, modules this year. Um, and I actually saw a couple of our um, teachers in training who are enrolled in PI in the breakout session. So they can vouch for me here. Um, these are the things that participants will go through. So reclaiming the education of our children. Why do we need to do this? What has the history of indigenous education been to us? And where are we at now? Where are we going? Module two is our ABAR work. Our anti-bias, anti-racist workshop to take a look at ourselves so that we don't continue to perpetuate white supremacy culture characteristics in our own edu educational system. Module three is the how, you know, so now we looked at why, we looked at um, how did we get here, where have we been, where do we want to go? Module three is like, this is how we do it. Um, and you know, for us, that's showing what KCLC is. We're not the best, we're not the answer, um, but we've learned some things, and so we want to share um, and you know, just just help grow awareness in that way. Module four is the wider world of Indian education, and so this is looking at what else is out there, what else exists that we don't have to continue to rely on the public education system on the K twelve model. And then modules, um, module five is indigenous knowledge systems. Again, this is figuring out what already exists in our communities and how can we pull from it to turn it into academic content. Modules six and seven are about um, creating an immersion program and a native language, dual language education program. And this is because you cannot do, especially a language like ours that is not written, you can't do the standard dual language programming. There are major tweaks that need to be made to make sure it's effective for language learning when the goal is fluency. Um, and then module eight and nine, we bring in a guest instructor to tie all of these modules together. And module 10, we call the tyranny of outcomes. This is about rethinking what education is, rethinking again what success and achievement is and how when we change the ideas of success and achievement we also need to change the process to get there um, our teacher training is also um, comes from this idea of Montessori and the whole Pueblo child and so you can take a look at this and I'll just talk specifically about the ultimate goals um, the U.S. approach is preparation for work in a competitive work environment and society and participatory citizenship. So really this is like achievement in an individualistic sense. You know, let me be the best. Let me make the most money, the highest paying job. Montessori is really about the preparation for lifelong learning, for creativity, for the idea of loving what you do, and to really... Um, just be a, a wholesome, well-balanced person. And that matches heavily with um, our way of life here in the public. And so participation in, the, in all the community where everybody's showing up and being able to rely on each other, 
um, strong spirituality and culturally grounded. Um, and so I can do good all by myself, but I also know that when I do good by myself, I'm going to share it in some way with my community. Um, what we try to get away from in our school program, in our teacher training program, are these characteristics. So um, white supremacy culture characteristics, moving away from this, letting them go, checking ourselves when it comes to these different things. Um, so that we can move back to our own way of being with one another. Um, and so when we think about teacher training for us, um, it comes from our language. And so language is everything. It's what holds all of our indigenous knowledge systems together. It's how we see the world. It's how we think. It's about living the values that are in our language. It's about the way we treat our children. Um, and so our language, like I said earlier, is the core of all of our programming that we do with our children. But our language is also the core, the center, the foundation of everything that we do in our teacher training program. Um, and so like for this breakout, you know, it's use it or lose it. And for us, we use it to develop um, what it is we want to instill in our children. These are just some questions um, to consider. I know we're not going to have time like to do breakout groups in this workshop, um, but as we move through teacher training, these are some things that we, we ask people. Um, wherever you come from, whatever your tribal nation affiliation might be, what is that worldview? What does that mean to you? When you think of the aspects of education and teacher training, how do those look different than what has been the standard, than what has been the norm? How do you not get in your own way? And what do you need to let go of in order to fully nurture your children in your own indigenous worldview? And what are some things you can agree to do or not to do in order to move your work forward? Um, your education program doesn't have to be about what academic outcomes your students will reach or achieve. It can be about how you as a staff, as administration, as leaders in the work, how will you nurture your children and nourish their spirit to be indigenous children of your respective communities? When they're whole and who they are as children, and this is nurtured, they will also reach their full academic potential. Um, and they won't have to do so at the expense of their languages, beliefs, and ways of life. Um, so again, our language is where you build from. Um, our language contains the content, and this content all on its own is rigorous. Um, for us, it's important to remember that no one tells us these things, and so it's up to us. If you don't teach your teachers to teach your children these things, who will? You know, if you don't pull from your own indigenous knowledge systems to build your curricula, who will? The public school doesn't, it hasn't. And that is the end of my presentation. Sorry, I had to kind of speed through that. Thank you so much, Tracy. You're doing such amazing, amazing things and I'm, I'm so excited to, I, you know, about all the things that you're working on, because I'm like, I want to go to Carrie's Children's Learning Center, you know, I wish I had the, you know, the time to go out there, um, but unfortunately, obviously, the pandemic, but I really love what you're doing, and I really love this quote, I'm going to put it in here, because I think it's amazing, that it can be, it can be about how you as staff and administration will nurture your children and nourish their spirits to be Indigenous children in respective communities, and I really think that it's really awesome that, you you put that in there because that vision really speaks volumes in terms of like it's not just about what you teach them it's like how you treat these children to grow and become like the future you know what I mean so thank you again Tracy and at the very end just for the interest of time everyone I'm gonna have a joint Q&A for um all three of the presenters so then y'all can you could have more time and then we can direct the questions as we need I'll read them off and we can we can direct them to each presenter just to make it easier if that works for all of you so we'll just abridge this agenda a little bit. So right now I'm gonna allow 
Ryan to pull up his um, presentation just so we can get that queued up. Ryan, do you got it? Or you need us to sit down? All righty, I think he's got it. So he's pulling that up. And um, and how we're gonna be presenting today from the Cherokee Nation. Um, and they are amazing people. Ryan um, is currently the Cherokee Language Master Apprentice Program Manager, and he acts as a facilitator, learner, and teacher. Um, and he's worked in the Immersion School for Cherokee Nation, which his son also attends. Um, he's worked with lots of Cherokee speakers and tribal language programs throughout his years. Um, so he's gonna be super awesome. And um, Howard Payton, he's also a member of the Cherokee Nation. Um, his family is born and bred in Oklahoma since Cherokee removal. Um, he's graduated from uh, VN High School and has a pre-law degree from Northeastern State University. He's, his, most of his career is focused in Indian child welfare, so he's super, he's super knowledgeable. Um, he recently became the executive director of um, the Department of the Cherokee Language Program. Um, so yeah, so we'll hear from them now. Siona Godwin. Ani Sahon de Giyan. You are seeing. Old Sultan, Wadagali scale down down. She had a deep tossy out of Tessy Donna, no Jay Kalakinella. Sudan nail, Dawa de Lanahi, Jews go gay, son. We do your league. My name is Wad, and it's, it's a pleasure to be here with everybody, and I wanted to greet everybody in our language. And I also wanted to introduce uh, the director of our, our new language department, Udawa Deeds, Howard Payton. We are pleased to be able to visit with you and, and um, share a little bit about what's going on in our program. If you see at the top of this slide here, it says, Chilat Gaboni Thies, Donny Recess. And that translates to Cherokee language planters. When we started our Master of Prince Language program, this was the title of, of that program. However, now that we have a language department, this has become the title of the language department. This presentation is under the auspice of our ANA grant, Native um, Language Community and Coordination in LCC. It's a, it's a partnership. And we received this grant about four years ago and we used it as a foundation to help strengthen and align our language programs throughout the Cherokee Nation. Howard and I um, applied for this grant, we received it and, and we are still directly involved with it, with its execution. There we go. Initially, our language programs were divided up into different departments. We had several different departments that were providing different aspects of, of our language needs. However, there was some repetition. When we applied for the NLCC grant, our goal was to enable ourselves to come together and, and create an opportunity for us to share a unified vision, a unified curriculum, a unified language board, and uh, to revamp our teacher certification process, both internally within the Cherokee Nation, also externally with the state of Oklahoma. This grant, we call it which translates to our unified language curriculum. It had these three initial objectives, but the underlying purpose of our goals for this grant was to unite our programs um, together with one, one intention, with one mind, with one mission. Initially, there were three different groups that have been united under a new language program, or pardon me, a new language department. Howard is the new director of this language department. However, he was the program manager for the, the old uh, Cherokee Master Finnish Language Program. Under his leadership, we developed this program, we've applied and received grants, and we started at what's called the 14th Generation Academy, which is an after-school program and a summer intensive for our for our immersion school graduates. The immersion school 
and the other Cherokee language programs were all under our Department of Education. We united together this last summer and we were able to work together in a way that we have been unable to in the past. We use strategy to align our goals and to align our purposes. And our entire goal is to strengthen our language so every Cherokee has the opportunity to speak their language. We believe it is a human right to have uh, access to your language. It's actually a human right to be able to speak. Cherokee Nation has long endeavored to provide this to their citizens. However, initially, we realized that many of our language programs were not meeting our needs. Many of our language programs were focused on colors, animals, and numbers. This sort of enrichment approach had a very wide reaching effect. It got a lot of people interested in the language. However, after they got through the door, they were not able to really develop their language proficiency. About 15 years ago, we started the immersion school and that allowed for our, our young children to have the opportunity to stay in the language. It's from ages three years old all the way up through sixth grade, approximately 12, 14 years old. And we're adding on a seventh and eighth grade. Our goal is to ensure that our young people have the language, but we also realized that we couldn't put all of our eggs in one basket. When those young people went home, their parents more often than not did not speak Cherokee. It's the older generation that does. And they did not have the opportunity to maintain their language after they left the immersion school. Also, we realized that without an opportunity to create new speakers that were adults, we would have no Cherokee teachers. Most of the teachers in our immersion school were elders. Many of them had teaching certifications. However, they had already retired from public school systems. They came out of retirement to teach young children, and some of them were already tired before they started. Our adults, the age of the, the parents and the children, we wanted to speak Cherokee. It just happened to be that we were the generation where it stopped. So we developed the Master Apprentice Program to ensure that adults could learn the language as well. We focused on teacher training. We thought that the first people that should be taught Cherokee should be those that are going to reach out and teach, teach Cherokee to the community people. We hope that by expanding our resources and our human capacity, that public schools and other Cherokee departments would would be able to use graduates from our program as Cherokee language teachers. We're really excited about the development because it provided that adults could stay in the language 40 hours a week, basically five days a week from eight in the morning until five for a two year period. And we believed that we were gonna be able to get our speakers, our learners up to a level where they would be able to carry on conversations. We did understand that we were not probably going to be able to create second language speakers that were close at all to any degree for our native first language speakers. We've gone a lot further than we initially thought that we would. The grant itself had some very um, broad reaching visions. Our goal was, was beyond just simply creating immersion schools and aligning our, our our language efforts under one rubric. We wanted to create a different atmosphere when it came to the language within our organization. And we believe that if the Cherokee Nation as an organization stepped up and demonstrated leadership when it came to language and language acquisition, that it would become infectious. And it would carry out to our communities and our young people would be activated to go out into their own communities and basically teach themselves. We've had Cherokee language programs for the last 40 years and we've had some amazing leaders and amazing thinkers. However, because we focused primarily on enrichment, we were not really able to produce speakers. There have been some second language learners that have been able to, through their own resources and efforts, partnership and apprentice, not not in any sort of direct way, but indirectly with our native speakers, and they've been able to become conversational. And folks my age were the ones that got together and said that we needed to do something about this. 
At this point, um, I want Howard to go ahead and step forward. Your dog would be a sailor loose. Who won't he? But oh, go ahead and lead you see what seal in the garden. Who dog would this dog would do? Charlie go on his new sister. Dog will all stand at home. Could you neg? I would touch the dollar left. I lead you to Nella. No. Hello, I'm Howard Payton. I did want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit of Cherokee before we got started. Uh, Ryan has done a wonderful job um, talking about uh, the NLCC and the various uh, programs that Cherokee Nation has. Um, and uh, we're you know, in the middle of, of uh, big things that we're about to uh, launch soon. I, I had the honor to go to uh, the site where our first language village is going to be set up today and um, it's the first five homes for for just Cherokee speakers that's going to be right beside our new language center that we're building so um, it won't be long before we have a a center that's about uh, 50,000 square foot um, that will house all the the, the various programs as has to do with language um, the immersion school the master apprentice program translation uh, and um, you know the radio station different things like that but behind it and beside it there'll be a language village that's for our speakers to to be able to move in um and you know slowly but surely we will integrate students uh in that village so uh it will be nice to have a, a place that it's only for our language uh, where, to, where people could live uh side by side and after you get out of emergency school or master apprentice program, you are still within uh, the language, so you never leave it. So um, just like Wad was saying, um, there's a lot of things to this and uh, by no means do we know it all. We, we know a few things over the course of time and just kind of bumping through um, what we've, uh, uh, you know, tried to uh, understand and, and learn about our language. Um, and we've visit, visited a lot of different programs throughout the, the U.S. and we've tried to uh, borrow other ideas and thoughts. And, uh, and we've, in Oklahoma, we would say there's no shame in our game because um, if, if we come to your tribe and you have a, a better thought, then we're going to try to borrow pieces of that. Um, just like Ryan was saying, um, you know, when you're learning your language, it's something that you have to do every day. Uh, you can't uh, let one day uh, go aside. Uh, just uh, a few months ago, we lost uh, Durban Filling, which was a, a dear friend of all of us that uh, had uh, done so much for our language. And uh, really, we feel like we're standing on his shoulders every day. Um, but after years of him telling us exactly what to do when ryan and i went to him and told him we was going to try to start a master apprentice program he starts going through his books and all this you know because he wrote down virtually half of his thoughts and he started going through this his different books i think it was like may the 10th 1975 or something he has this all written down exactly what to do to start a master apprentice and so um uh, and, you know, he had already thought it. He said, this is what you boys are going to, to try to build. And we looked at one another and was amazed as we always are when we was around Durban and said, yes. Um, just on his, you might say his deathbed, we was, I went around and, and to visit him. And, and uh, I was so excited because I thought he was going to, you know, I thought he was going to pass before I got to tell him about the language village. And I went in and I said, Durban, you know, we were getting the language village and this, this is where it's going to be. And I started showing them pictures and, and uh, I was waiting for the next thing. And um, what he ended up doing was saying, like, what, what's our next step? You know, tell us what to do next. Because after the master apprentice, he told us you have to build a, a language village. And um, so what's our next step? And his, his thought was, was uh, now you have to speak it every day. You can't let one day go without speaking your language. And, uh, 
And I, I remember just being, you know, floored that after, you know, uh, decades of, of dedicating his life to language revitalization, um, the, sim the, the simple thing is to speak it. Uh, never give up or ask permission to use your language. Um, reach proficiency levels that it's hard to lose it. What we've found, and I think Ryan has a, uh, you know, a graph here and a little bit about the actual standards, is um, we we found that after you hit the advanced level, uh, it is it becomes harder to to lose your language. Um, we've we've had several students who graduated in master apprentice. We've had several students who graduated in the merger school that did not hit the advanced levels. Uh, but after we hit advanced level, we have found as for our language, uh, that's the period that um, you no longer lose it. And so if you want to retain uh, your language, then, then try to, to stay away from just can language. We, uh, we kind of, um, I don't know if it's talking trash, but um, we kind of talk about can language quite a bit with, with color animals and numbers. And we said, you know, there's nothing wrong with can language, but after teaching that for 40 years, we didn't, we didn't build a single speaker. So uh, what we've learned is you, you, have to, you have to get into immersion. You have to get into some sort of integration of just your language. And if you hit advanced levels, uh, you will no longer lose your language. Um, the years to come, you still speak. Uh, you can still speak Cherokee. Now that doesn't mean you can just put it on the shelf, but it, it means that uh, the language decay becomes harder. Enlist a supportive uh, coalition of speakers. Don't let the rest stop you. So you're always going to go against somebody that, or meet somebody that tells you to give up. Uh, if you let them get in your head, uh, then um, you're, you might as well not even start this journey. So, uh, some of the things that you have to, to realize before you even get started is uh, I'm not going to let uh, negative um, people's thoughts um, get me from, you know, from moving from day to day uh, to uh, save our language. Include every language learner, support each other. Um, you know, there's everybody, everybody has various levels of language and uh, this because somebody doesn't speak the level that you have uh, doesn't mean that you don't uh, try to speak with them and, and you always lift one another up. Um, you know, we have a concept that's called uh, Dejda You know, you have to be stingy with one another's existence. Dejda uh, These are the values and I think we'll get in there, get in that for their own. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Sir Tim Molte Kiritu. Um, do it today, tomorrow, and from now on, you do not have the luxury of patience. Now, I don't have his accent. He's uh, from New Zealand, but uh, Ryan does. And um, he started showing up at our program and would just kind of beat us up. Uh, uh, we found out who he was, and he's, we kind of call him the godfather of language revitalization because he he started a lot of that in the 60s and he helped the Hawaiians and different people throughout the years. And so um, he would tell us, you do not have the luxury of patience. And so uh, I would get aggravated and I said, boy, I need to be a better person. And Ryan would remind me, you don't have the luxury of patience. So it's all right to be aggravated. So Cherokee speakers, um, this is the scary part for us. And I know that uh, there's tribes out there that are a lot worse uh, shape than what we are, but we estimate about 2,000 speakers. Um, now these numbers, um, we started working uh, to collect these numbers a good time ago. Uh, at first we started doing little snapshots, I think in uh, June of 2013, we found out that we was losing uh, 34, we lost 34 speakers that one month. And then in uh, July, we lost 33 in 2013. 2013. Uh, we had some estimates from 2002. Uh, and finally, we we kind of became uh, tired of all of that. And we started what was called a speaker row, where we went out to the different uh, communities and had them sign a book. We found we had we handmade a, made a book, we put it all in Cherokee. And 
you know, we had every speaker that we could find signed that. Um, now, the pandemic kind of stopped us on a lot of it, but we still had about uh, 13 or 14,000, maybe maybe up to 15, uh, 13, 1400, maybe up to 1500 that we had signed that book. And it was neat. They wrote the Cherokee with their, their Cherokee names. and um, uh, But it we also had made a list of all the speakers that we knew. And so we know the ones that probably didn't um, uh, get to sign that book. But we did find a few that we hadn't even thought of. Um, the average age of these speakers is between uh, is around 65 now, I think it's 67. Um, if the number of Cherokee speakers is determined by, okay, there's about, there's less than half percent. I think when we first started looking at numbers, there was 0.6% of our population uh, a speaker, and now I think there's 0.5, and we're losing around 100 speakers a year. Um, we have, we've lost 12 to uh, COVID-19 thus far, and uh, I found out that we have about seven or eight of them sick, and one of them on ventilator right now, so um, keep, keep them in your prayers by all means. Uh, they must know what they're losing. Um, you know, this is one of the um, the biggest things is if if all you think of is in the mind of the oppressor, then how can you determine uh, what you're losing from an oppressor? Uh, if all you can think of is in English, and that's that's uh, the very map and avenue that was used for oppression for all all these years, then uh, how can you even evaluate what you're losing? If you don't have some sort of semblance of who who you are and uh, and what um, what you're losing, so here's some things that we we have. There's about 40 of these value systems, and I don't know if uh, Ryan has put them all up or if this is something that we will will have to um, go over. But I'll go through some of them. Um, in Cherokee, there's a there's four different ways that uh, that you you can determine love. And um, one of them is vegetage, you say, Steve. You can see this, the fourth one down, uh, to be stingy of one another's existence like a mother with a child. Now, if that's one of the attributes of, of love, a uh, vegetage is y'all the one another. Uh, in Cherokee, we do have y'all. And um, gay you is, um, is that part of maybe uh, fighting for or clinging to something to be stingy. It would be something like um, if I was going to have a, this cup in front of me and you was going to try to take it away, I would move uh, where my body would be in between that, that and you. So I would protect whatever I was clinging to uh, with everything within me. And Sesti is from here on out. Dejda uh, Sesti. Um, this is a pretty cool value where we have a, you have to like one another. Um, uh, what what I heard of one elder say is there has to be, a, um, there has, to, there's a piece of God in everybody's face. And, um, and once you uh, go around one another, you have, to, your goal is to find that piece of God. And, um, uh, and to replicate that, find it in their face and replicate it and implement it in your own face. And so when you get two, two people, you continually are finding these pieces of God and you're putting them in your own face. Um, to love one another, you have to find something to admire about one another. Uh, to struggle to hold on to one another, to cling to one another. Um, this is to hold on to, and never let go. Uh, if you really, really love somebody, you're you hold on to them and never let go. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, uh, you're a stalker. You know, this is this is a, um, uh, something more spiritual and more of God than that. Uskedi desda yila sesti to treat one another's existence as sacred. Um, and so, this is something that uh, uh, I think of quite a bit. Um, in my family, I was taught to, uh, when my mother came in when I was 12 years old, and she said, uh, 
know, Howard, I started praying for you when I was 16, way before you was ever born. And when you was born, I started praying for uh, your your wife, who you would, you know, marry your spouse uh, and uh, your children. And so now it's time for you to uh, to pray for whoever you're going to marry and to pray for your children. Um, and years later, I had an Indian child welfare to ask me, said, you know, what makes what makes one person not, you know, be involved in domestic violence? And uh, I, I told that story and I said, we're taught this value to treat one another's existence as sacred. And, um, you know, my wife has been prayed for from my family ever since I was born. And I started praying for her when I was 12. So she's sacred. And how could I ever touch her? How could I ever do anything wrong to her? Because she's sacred. That's part of our value of love. But to look at just the mainstream uh, value system, you would never, you would never see this. And all of these have, you know, every one of these words have uh, 30 minutes or an hour, maybe two hours of teaching behind them. And so in order for somebody to really get behind uh, saving your language, you have to first know what you're losing. Um, so that's, that's a very, very important aspect of it. Uh, we thank you guys and um and ryan do you have anything else to add sir no i think you covered everything well done well done thank you so much howard thank you so much um and what if for presenting um you did such a great job and i'm so envious of all the work that you're doing i hope to one day be able to do that for my own people um, and so at this time, I'm gonna share my screen again so that we can have a mini Q&A session. I know we were crunched for time, but I did want you to all be able to have the time to finish because I value your time. And I mean, it's the pandemic, what else are we doing? We're having fun seeing our, our own people and getting to know and meet one another, right? So let me share my screen again real quick and then we'll have time for Q&A. And I did ask if you do have a question, please type it in the box and just um, in the chat box and tell me who it is directed towards and I will read it off for you um, just to make it easier. And I'll give us about like eight or so minutes because um, I know you have other sessions and I'm sure y'all would like a break too. Um, and I know our presenters are probably hungry. Um, so I will give that time and then let me share my screen. For you. Um, let's see. So our first question. is for Tracy um, from Terry C. She said, um, when are we going to implement a language model from our own understanding that is guided by our values? This question is for you. Okay, I let's see here. I, I don't understand. Um, the, the time question when are or who we are Terry if you can clarify when are we going to implement a language model from our own understanding yeah the question is that I hear I, I listen and I looked at your presentation from um, using the Montessori model and then um, <clears throat> the activities that are geared towards the math and science and, and the other subject, social studies, is there any chance of having our own model rather than using or borrowing somewhere else, you know? I see, I see, yeah. And that, um, you know, that's a great question. And here's, here's the thing that comes along with that is um, time and energy and resource. Right, so for us, we use, we pull from the Montessori method because it, it has everything that we would need to deliver the, na the language naturally without having to rethink, reinvent the will. Um, and so um, part, of, part of what we do that is borrowing from the Montessori, half is borrowing from the Montessori method, 
The other half is that the beauty of the Montessori curriculum is that you can tailor it to your own. And so an example of this is in the elementary curriculum, there are um, five great stories. They're called the lesson is five great stories. One of the stories is about how the world came to be. And so the standard Montessori curriculum comes with the story about how the world came to be from the outside world, right? From a European sense of where the world came to be. So when we get that work, what we do is take that apart and build all of our own beliefs about how the world came to be into that same lesson. And so we're swapping out what is ours, what makes more sense for our way of life, and then what does Montessori have that we can use because it's not really different. Um, and so, um, so I think, you know, there's a, a lot of good that can come from doing it ourselves, like from the ground up. But when you think about like energy, when you think about human capacity, when you think about the urgency, um, it's also nice to be able to pull, pull from where you can, where and when it exists. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. Thank you for your answer. And we have another question from Angel Washington, actually a fellow ANA member. Um, she said, are there a lot of tribes using the Montessori philosophy, Tracy? Um, I don't know, Angel, an exact number, but I can tell you um, there are there are quite a few and at the same time, not many, right? And so um, indigenous Montessori is, is definitely growing. There's probably off the top of my head about 15 programs that I can think of nationwide. Um, and so um, it could be more though. Part of what's hard about Montessori is that it's so inaccessible and very expensive. So we're working on, on taking that back. Awesome. Um, and Tracy, there is one other question from Mary Martinez. She said, what grades does your school cover? So using the Montessori approach, um, it doesn't, we don't follow grades, right? Kindergarten, first grade, second grade. Montessori philosophy comes with mixed age classrooms. And so right now we have two classrooms. One is the primary classroom where our children are two and a half up through six in one class. The next class they move up is the elementary class where children are in from the time they're six years old up through their through the time they're 12 years old. And so mixed age classrooms, this is based on real life learning, right? You're not ever categorized just by your age and anything else you do. And it matches the way we learn in our community. And so that's another reason why we pull from the Montessori approach. So right, the short answer, I guess, is that the school covers children until they're 12 years old. And then we're gonna build the adolescent program, which covers children from 12 to 16. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and so this question is again from uh, Mary Martinez and this is for Howard and for Wade. How long has the language evaluation process taken? And we have so much to do within our tribe and not enough teachers to do it, um, doing everything to develop our program. So the real question is just how long is the language revitalization process taken for you guys? Or what was the process and how was it like? Well, initially, it, Durban was one of the, Durban Filling Jagesa was one of the primary leaders in the late 60s, early 70s. And he began to teach literacy to native speakers out in the communities. As uh, native speakers began to pass, he saw that there was a need to equip second language learners. and. And he um, went to local universities. He, he worked for different programs. But the real effort for, for true language revitalization began about 15 years ago with the immersion school when we became serious about the language. And, and every few years, you know, we, we try to buckle down and get serious again. But it's just been very recently in the last four or five years where we've been successful at creating highly proficient second language speakers. And uh, with our new administration and uh, coupled with the success of our program, they want to support the language now that it, it can be shown that we can be successful. They uh, wanna pull, um, put full and intensive effort into it. And it takes resources, it takes time. We have to build up the teachers. Um, so I, I would say, you know, 
seriously, we've, we've been working at it for about 15 years and we've really buckled down in the last four or five years. you and oh ooh, there we go oh, that was smart that was smart I'm just posting in there in the chat um does anyone have any other questions for any of our presenters no question but i would like to share oh yeah not today rafina from guam yeah, I'm a 35 year educator in teaching of the indigenous Chamorro language, but this is what's happening since we're talking about revitalization. Since the birth of the immersion program, which started uh, with our master plan, uh, immersion master plan two years ago. So we're in, we're in our second year. So right now we have kinder and first graders, and this is the pipeline. So from uh, Hural Academy, Nene Academy means the uh, two-year-old up to four or five-year-old, they go into the kindergarten. And then the, and this is the commitment from the parents. So now we have, I'm also a member of the board for the language commission for Guam. And in our uh, strategic plan, we have, we focus on the language and culture and history. So uh, for the language part, we also have a revitalization center. Um, because we need to support the pipeline of the immersion program. And it's not gonna stop up to fifth grade. It's gonna to go to middle school and high school and definitely even the second, the highest uh, ed education, which is the University of Guam and GCC. So we're building capacity. We start from our immersion and because the immersion is here already for Guam. So now all our stakeholders, uh, you know, we're, we're now uh, giving the support. We're getting so much support now and and it's for the best of our, our language it's going to strengthen our language and uh, and our culture uh, i i am really grateful for and it's true somebody mentioned administration i guess it depends on administration i've been with so many decades of different administrations so they just have to have the passion for our language uh you know and also legislation it takes also good legislation uh so yeah Thank goodness we're really like a step ahead for Guam. One of the questions that I see is, is what an example of a value that guides our education has it been passed on to you. And um, I think that, you know, we have an infinite number of these values and we still are learning about them. For our native speakers, um, they don't seem very novel, and sometimes they don't even realize how amazing they are. However, every time we hear a new one, we we fixate upon it. And one of them that is stuck uh, deep in my core is "nasu gogana." "Nasu gogana" means um, to never end, to never cease, to never give up. And for me, as an educator, um, that's that's my driving focus. That we fail again and again and again, but that's not where we stop. All that is, is one step, one step towards the solution. And uh, Nasul Golgana reminds us that we, we don't have the luxury to be patient. We have to get up, dust ourselves off, kiss our own boo-boos and keep going. Thank you for that. No, uh Ryan adds that um, for a long time, we tried everything we could think of and you know, we pushed and we pushed and we pushed. And I remember, I don't know how many times we would get up on at one of the grounds, spend, a, we're gonna have a whole week, we're not gonna speak a word of English. And, and you know, at least my fluency wasn't at the level it needed to be. And we'd have a whole group of people um, and, even if we wasn't successful, it's just that we would draw a line in the sand and we're, we're not going to lose our language. Uh, when uh, when people said there was no way to learn our language, um, we believed that there was. And over time, uh, it's been proven. And 
where it, it took 20 years to build the first three or four. Uh, now we're building 16 a year. Uh, it's a it's high proficient speakers. And so um, it takes a lot of grit, a lot of determination and, um, and stick to itness, if that's a word. Thank you, Howard. Um, and thank you for uh, to all the presenters. Um, and so at this time, I will say that we are running short on time um, and your networking session is about to begin. So I encourage you all to attend that. Um, I will say that I will put this up here on the screen too, just so y'all can have this. Um, all the presenters contact information in case you want to contact them. I'll leave their emails on here. Um, thank you again, Howard and Wada and Tracy for participating in this workshop and for providing all this awesome insightful knowledge and language retention and training. Um, in my own language, I say kina to you all. Um, and I hope to see you and work with you in the future. So everyone have a great rest of their day and I hope you have fun in the networking session. I'll talk to you all later. Bye you guys. Ana, ni tapuak.